Good morning. Welcome to the Energy Futures webinar. I'm Stuart Muir, CEO of ResourceWorks. And today, over the next hour, up until 12 noon Pacific, we'll be taking you through the updates that you're aware of through the emails you've received. Thanks for being here. We have a good turnout today. Some of you were on the call earlier in June, in all likelihood, and there may be some of you who are new. So we're going to recap a little bit what we've been doing, but also focus mainly on the news we have, which has to do with the 10 recommendations that came out of the six months of policy work. Um, quick introduction. Um, I, I have been uh, the leader of Resource Works for the past 10 years. I actually helped to get it started. And in the last uh, 10 months, I've been working closely with Barry Penner, whose name is well known. If you're on the call, you undoubtedly know who Barry Penner is. You can read all about him. Uh, we started a project. We just call it Energy Futures. We have a website. We've been focusing on British Columbia energy system issues. And the reason for that is that over time, it became evident that there are some questions around the implementation of policy, the good intentions to do what we all believe in. I'm sure everyone here wants to have a legacy of a more environmentally efficient and high-performing climate-sensitive energy system. How do we do that? It's not as easy in practice as it is in theory, it turns out. So we're, we're raising some uh, questions. We're coming forward with some ideas to be a constructive part of coming to better outcomes for everyone. That's what we're all about. The, the product that we released back in June was meeting BC's energy needs toward a provincial strategy. Uh, and and uh, we released it uh, accompanied by the first town hall we did. And we had a very strong turnout. Pretty much everyone who attended, we, we learned, stayed right to the end. I, I think that if you're on this call, there's a likelihood that you are interested and informed on these issues. You care about them. You have an opportunity today to raise questions because there's, there's a Q&A tool. And if you received emails, by the way, you will, will have received a link to the report. So if you want to follow along that way, we're also going to do a slide presentation that, that we'll walk through. Um, and you could go to your email to find a link to the report. But if you just simply go to energyfuturesinstitute.ca, you'll easily find it there too. So uh, moving along. Um, as I say, we've been around a while. We, we launched in December 2023. We've been talking about the electricity system. We discovered very early on that British Columbia is actually in deficit. Uh, a legendary producer and exporter of electricity suddenly is importing more power than it than it produces. How, how did that come about and what does it mean for decisions being made? Uh, we're independent. Uh, Resource Works is an independent, not-for-profit registered BC society. We, I have a board that's my boss. And in doing Energy Futures as a project on, on the side of uh, Resource Works, we've operated under uh, the, the, the auspices of, of Resource Works, um, energy security, affordability, independence, and the energy trilemma. How do you do all this while well, being environmentally high performing? Uh, we've broken some news. We've, uh, um, uh, on quite a few occasions, even today, Barry Penner has been the voice and champion of this project. I'm going to turn things over to Barry Penner, KC, to lead us through the next part of the presentation. Barry, over to you, sir. Uh, thanks very much, Stuart. Um, yes, uh, he was just alluding to the fact, Stuart was alluding to the fact, I was just on CKNW this morning, uh, talking to Mike Smith about the uh, fact that sites, the Site C Dam, which has been under construction now for uh, a very long time, is they're starting to fill the reservoir. That was some news that was out this week. Uh, so Mike just had me on his radio show on CKNW to talk about, will that actually solve all of our electricity challenges? And of course, the answer is no, and you would know that if you've been following along what we've been uh, communicating. Um, so yeah, we've been, uh, as Stuart points out, uh, identifying a number of issues that have come forward. And really, that was something that was quite startling last year when we found out we were importing 20% of our electricity needs, uh, which is a record amount. British Plum has never been so dependent on outside forces uh, sources of electricity. Uh, and then that came, uh, shortly after that came along this uh, energy reliability reliability report from an entity with the acronym NERC. Uh, 
North American Energy Reliability Corporation, which is a not-for-profit, uh, but very technical oriented, looking at utilities across North America to see if they're maintaining legislated requirements for uh, reliability. And that means having adequate reserves in place to respond to unforeseen circumstances. And what uh, really raised eyebrows was that NERC for the first time identified British Columbia as being at risk of not meeting those reliability standards uh, starting as early as 2026 or 2027. And then, you know, they go into the reasons for that, which is really um, parallels the work that we're doing, identifying growing demand and then changes in energy policy here in British Columbia that are putting at risk our reliability uh, by doing a number of things. Uh, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, we've talked about infrastructure uh, viability for electric vehicles. We put out a specific report on that commissioned by prof or written by Professor Jerome Jessorali. He's a business professor at BC Institute of Technology. And uh, one of the takeaways from his report was uh, we won't have adequate uh, recharging infrastructure. And uh, tied to that is that if we really did replace internal combustion engine vehicles in British Columbia, with all electric vehicles, that by 2040, we would require two more Site C dams worth of electricity just for electric vehicles, never mind other growth in the economy and other policies such as replacing natural gas with electric heating. So uh, that was an important uh, milestone and that report's getting uh, recognition across the country as uh, you know, really shining a spotlight on, on some of the practical challenges of lofty goals. Uh, we also uh, sh sh helped shine a spotlight on a decision by the Utilities Commission that was released just before uh, Christmas Eve, and people were busy uh, lining up to buy last-minute gifts uh, when the BC Utilities Commission announced they would not allow Fortis BC to expand natural gas supplies in the Okanagan to meet growing demand. The Utilities Commission did not question that demand was growing, but pointed to the Clean BC policy as saying, while well, we're not supposed to be using natural gas for uh, new heating uh, for either hot water or space heating uh, in residential and commercial buildings uh, by uh, the latest year 2030. And so they challenged Fortis to come back with an alternative plan. So we uh, jumped on that and pointed out the difficulties that that would pose to our electrical system uh, because forcing more people to use electricity, especially during the coldest days of the year, puts increasing strain in our already stressed system at the time that it's the most strained, which is on those peak cold days. Um, there is some news there. Uh, BC uh, Premier Fortis has recently filed a plan B at the request of Utilities Commission. It wasn't their first option, but since the Utilities Commission would not allow them to expand natural gas pipeline capacity, uh, Fortis has come up with an alternative plan, which is to truck natural gas, if you can believe it, from the lower mainland, from the Tilbury plant, and truck it up and over the Coquihalla uh, into the Okanagan to try and maintain supplies uh, during the coldest times of the year. Um, you can uh, wonder what's better uh, from a GHG perspective, uh, trucking uh, large volumes of gas up and over the Coquihalla and back uh, with empty trucks uh, or moving it in a pipeline. Uh, next slide. So as uh, Stuart mentioned, we've been working uh, for more than six months, really um, digging deep into various interconnections uh, within our energy system in British Columbia, because it is interconnected. Um, you make a change in one area, it's gonna have an impact in another. Uh, for example, prohibiting natural gas will put more strain on our electricity system. So we've taken a look at some of the previous assumptions about electricity supply and concluded that those assumptions are outdated uh, which have sadly been proven true as we've been importing even more amounts of electricity this year than we did last year at this time. And uh, noting that electricity demand is growing uh, and uh, BC government policies are helping accelerate that demand for electricity. Uh, so there's, there's organic growth taking place anyway with population size increasing in British Columbia, changes in our economy, uh, things like artificial intelligence and everybody wanting larger screens for their televisions and so on. There's more electricity demand, um, but then there's these policy measures 
that are accelerating that increased demand and strain on our system. Uh, next slide. So uh, typically over the last few decades, uh, analysts would say electricity demand would grow about 1% per year. And many assumptions were built based on that for utility planning. But in recent years, uh, and really just in, when I say recent, I mean like in the last two or three years, uh, that demand is accelerating. And in the last few months, in the first few months of this year, according to the US Energy Information Agency in the United States, Demand for electricity has increased by three or 4% over just a short period of time, just in the last few months. Um, whether that's sustained remains to be seen. There could be a variety of you know, one-time factors, exceptional heat waves, um, various other outages in other parts of the system. But uh, we are seeing an accelerating rate of growth of far more than the typical 1% that had been used for planning assumptions. Uh, and of course, we've already talked about the increasing electricity imports um, and BC Hydro has been doing that in part to conserve the uh, reduced amount of water we have flowing into our reservoirs to, to hold that water back behind the dams so we can hopefully meet peak demand in January or December whenever the, the whenever the next cold snap comes try and hold that water back and in the meantime uh, import electricity where we can uh, and then looking at uh, our policy gaps. And again, the assumptions, for example, in the clean BC plan, it starts off on the premise that we have an abundant supply of clean electricity. Uh, abundant would assume that we have more than we need, if you look up the dictionary definition. Um, but in fact, as we pointed out, we've now been importing record amounts of electricity. Uh, next slide. And by the way, I don't know if viewers can see me or not, uh, Stuart, I, I can see you, but I'm not sure if uh, I'm visible, but um, if not, then maybe viewers can be relieved that <laughs> they don't have to see me, but um, it's, it's not clear on my you. screen. I think people can see both of us. Okay. I'm not seeing that feedback here, but um, so uh, after taking into account uh, comments and questions that came in after our last town hall that we did, and by the way, thank you for those. We went through those comments and suggestions and uh, it's debated them, discussed them, uh, researched a bit more, uh, actually quite a bit more, and uh, put out a report. I think it was released on July the 18th, but uh, subject to check. Um, and it's called Meeting BC's Energy Needs Towards a Provincial Energy Strategy. We're not pretending that this itself is a comprehensive strategy document, but rather it's highlighting 10 uh, kind of themes or specific items that we think should be part of a comprehensive updated energy plan for British Columbia that recognizes uh, what has changed uh, since certain assumptions were made. So it falls into br three broad categories. And, and again, in my intro here, I've touched on them. Domestic energy production, transmission and infrastructure and policy and governance. Uh, and we'll delve into that now in a bit more detail as we go through the next slides. So under energy, uh, production, you won't be surprised uh, that we're calling for more. But first of all, we think overarching all of this is a cost-benefit analysis and a requirement for an economic impact assessment for all energy and climate policies. Why economic impact assessments and cost-benefit analysis for these types of policies? Because they affect literally everything else. Everything in our economy, everything we do requires energy whether it's school buses taking children to school next week uh, or people going to the hospital for medical procedures that are urgently required, cancer treatment, um, mining operations, transit, whatever it is that drives our economy and our society is underpinned by available energy. Without that, nothing moves. So I may be stating the obvious, but I think it, it helps to remind us that things we take for granted don't just happen, it requires energy. And when the government comes along and makes significant changes in that energy mix, or tries to force people to do things differently, it can have a real significant knock-on effect to other things. And so to make sure we're anticipating all of that, we think there should be uh, comprehensive economic impact assessments and cost-benefit analysis that's made publicly available 
There was quite a controversy last year when the BC Business Council discovered through the back door of some government website, economic impact assessment of the clean BC policies. Uh, they had previously asked the government, have you done any modeling? And they were told no, not on economics. But then they discovered that in fact, there was some economic modeling that the government had themselves requested and had paid for from a consulting firm, a private consulting firm working for the government. Um, and so when the uh, BC Business Council released that information that previously had not been made public, <clears throat> the government was quick to disavow it or to indicate it was incorrect. Uh, so there's quite a bit of controversy. What are the real impacts of Clean BC? And given the uncertainty and the government saying, no, no, this study that we commissioned ourselves is not accurate, in terms of the numbers and you're not presenting it properly, we felt it it underscores just how important that there be some kind of credible third party analysis that's done. So we don't get into this kind of bun fight about whose numbers are correct uh, and make it publicly available. Uh, this is kind of a recurring theme in our recommendations. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm still recovering from COVID, which I had I'm sadly last month. <clears throat> and as you can see, it's my uh, souvenir from that's summer of 2024, um, but uh, bear with me. Um, anyway, uh, we believe there needs to be more transparency generally around decisions and uh, operations of energy systems in British Columbia, um, because it leads to this uncertainty, leads to disagreement, and it's hard to marshal public support if the public doesn't believe the information or the numbers are credible, the underpinnings of the policy are real. So. Uh, you'll see we are promoting greater transparency or recommending it. Uh, and one an additional way besides the impact uh, assessments for, in terms of economics and the cost benefit analysis is through a real time public dashboard uh, showing electricity production, use and imports and exports up from British Columbia. Uh, you could go online right now and see what types of electricity are being generated in Alberta and how much they're importing or exporting from their neighbors in Montana, British Columbia, or Saskatchewan. You could do the same, for example, in California or Ontario, but you can't in British Columbia. And we think just making that available to British Columbians will give us a more realistic sense of how our system operates and help build public understanding about what it takes to meet our needs here in British Columbia. Um, it may come to a surprise uh, for you that our legislative energy objectives and the Clean Energy Act, while it includes things like uh, affordability and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it does not include reliability as a legal touchstone or requirement when planning for the system. Um, system planners, I'm sure, will say, well, of course, we take that into account, but they're not legally required to under the legislation in British Columbia uh, in the Clean Energy Act. So we believe it would uh, be worthwhile uh, making a, a relatively simple amendment to include reliability to legislated energy objectives because, because lack of reliability would be, uh, as I mentioned, uh, completely disruptive to our economy and our society. And again, it's why it raised so many eyebrows when that report came out around Christmas last time from the North American Energy Reliability Corporation that British Columbia was at risk of maintaining reliability standards uh, as early as 2026 or 2027. So again, we think uh, some legislative action uh, is recommended or worthwhile here. Uh, we touched on this already about the need to increase domestic electricity production because of rapidly growing power needs and because of government policies around reducing greenhouse gas emissions, many of those policies depend on more electricity to displace other forms of energy. You know, electrifying mine production and so on, uh, you know, having those big trucks operate on electricity and so forth that you see in images of mining sites. Uh, all of this requires more electricity. And we think we need to have an open mind when we're assessing what are the possible solutions for generating more electricity and not take too many options off the table uh, before we really bear down on what are the, the pros and cons of each possibility. Uh, and along the way, in doing this work, we discovered that 
under Clean BC, it calls for actually decommissioning some existing power generation facilities in British Columbia. And uh, this is pointing to, again, it's in an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but the Clean BC roadmap says that uh, to help reduce emissions from the electricity sector, our limited amount of existing natural gas power generation should be phased out and shut down. Um, many of you will remember the Burrard Thermal Power Plant. It was a 900 megawatt natural gas power plant near Port Moody in the Lower Mainland. It has, has now been effectively decommissioned. It's no longer there as an option to generate electricity. And it, was to, it did run on natural gas when it was fired up and required to operate. That's off the table already. What's left is a power plant in, uh, in Campbell River on Vancouver Island, operated by Capital Power. Uh, it's you know an, an independent power producer in British Columbia selling its electricity to BC Hydro under contract. Uh, and there's also a project a power plant in Taylor, British Columbia, uh, associated with a natural gas processing plant. And there they generate uh, about 120, 110 megawatts of electricity on a fairly steady basis feeding into our grid. Uh, the project on Bank of Island is about 275 megawatts maximum capacity. And then BC Hydro owns and operates a couple of plants, one in Prince, uh, or, I mean, Fort Nelson and one in Prince Rupert to provide reliability in those areas that don't get necessarily always get enough electricity from the main grid. In fact, in Fort Nelson, they're not connected to the uh, integrated grid in the rest of British Columbia. So uh, phasing those projects out as required by Clean BC uh, was pointed to by this report by the North American Electricity Reliability Corporation as one of the reasons they're worried British Columbia won't maintain reliability standards in the future because that kind of power generation is dispatchable. It's there when you need it, you can turn it on. Uh, you don't have to hope for the wind to blow or for the sun to shine. Uh, it's there. Um, and uh, this summer, uh, BC Hydro has been making extensive use of the power plant on Vancouver Island and Campbell, at Campbell River. It's known as Island Generation. It's been generating just about full capacity uh, for most of July and much of August. Um, but within a year and a half or so, that won't be available to BC Hydro. Uh, they've been you know, directed under the Clean BC policy to not renew the, the power purchase agreement, the contract with that project. So if we're into another dry cycle and extended drought and not having enough water to generate electricity here with hydro dams, uh, that particular plant will not be an option to help us meet our needs. So uh, one of their, our recommendations is to cancel those plans to decommission existing power generation facilities uh, in order to bolster our reserves and make sure we do have enough uh, when we need it. Next slide. Um, we talk about in our policy recommendations about supporting First Nations reconciliation projects. Uh, there's many forms of reconciliation, but I think one of the more tangible ones is helping First Nations become more involved in our economy. At ResourceWorks, a lot of effort uh, through Stuart and his team has been put in, in terms of recognizing that and celebrating success uh, in terms of partnerships with Indigenous people and uh, other op uh, operators in the economy, other actors. And uh, in order to involve First Nations in uh, the economy, they of course need access to electricity. Many First Nations people live in fairly remote communities where there isn't necessarily adequate supply of electricity or reliable supply of clean energy um, because they're not necessarily living where the grid is available. So we continue to encourage the government to, and BC Hydro to look at ways to connect those communities that may not be connected and or provide alternatives. And, and then in terms of participating in projects, um, there are, as you've probably heard, the BC government and BC Hydro has gone out for a call for power requests for new likely wind power projects, although it won't have to be just wind, it could be other forms of non-emitting sources. The government's looking for 3,000 gigawatt hours, which is about 5%, uh, would be about a 5% addition to our overall supply in BC. Um, and But they've said in order for First Nations to be partners in these projects, and in order for these projects to be acceptable, they'd have to have 25% equity participation by First Nations. 
Now, it's good to have clear targets, but that is a very prescriptive uh, requirement. Uh, some First Nations in the past have participated in uh, renewable electricity projects like Rhino River Hydro projects or wind power projects. I'm just going to jump in because I'm seeing Barry's image frozen right now. And if others are seeing that, I'm just going to see if we can move along. I'm waiting to hear back from the team at ResourceWorks on the technical side to see if it's just me. I'm going to go to a couple of questions. And let me tell you that the uh, tool, you can see the Q&A, it's for, there for everyone who's on the call to participate in. Barry will be coming back in. Um, Barry, we lost you there. And I've just said to uh, our audience, uh, we'll take a question quickly and then you can resume going through. But we've got sure. some great questions and please do throw them in, folks. Uh, I'd like to ask this question. It, it is, to do with LNG Canada, the LNG project on the Northwest Coast, gas versus electricity. Um, what, what are the issues around energy reliability, affordability for the rest of BC from how that project goes? And I'm sure the questioner is thinking about phase two of that as well. Barry, would you like to just jump into that question before we resume the flow? Uh, again, that question was about phase two. I think the phase one and phase two, what are the implications if we electrify that? And for that matter, Cedar LNG and C. Le Sims LNG. Uh, what happens if these uh, do go to uh, electric drive? Well, uh, for that to take place. So more electricity generation is required and uh, maybe more challenging or just as challenging is how to get that electricity delivered from where it's generated. Uh, there currently is a 500 kilovolt line going out to the west coast to Prince Rupert and then, you know, breaking off to Karras and Kitimat. Um, but to support this additional uh, economic development, it's going to require upgrades of a very significant nature to the transmission capacity. BC Hydro is working on a, an expansion, uh, but their timelines are, you know, somewhere they're thinking maybe seven to 10 years. Uh, some people think that's optimistic. Others say it's not nearly fast enough. Um, planning is taking place, and it's part of the $36 billion capital plan announced by BC Hydro over 10 years. That was announced in January and is being reannounced in, bit, in bits and pieces uh, every few days by the, the government uh, right now. But that it's going to take a major infrastructure enhancement to get electricity at the quantities required. I don't have at my fingertips the total amount of electricity required to meet the demands of all those projects if they were to go to electric drive, but it is not an insignificant number. It's actually quite large. Thanks, Barry. Where did we leave off before we lost you? I think I was talking about just explaining why uh, having some flexibility in how First Nations can participate in projects uh, could be helpful. Because one of the concerns is uh, under this call for power that BC Hydro put out, uh, projects will not be eligible if they don't have 25% First Nations participation. And those those projects kind of arise where they where the opportunity is. So if you find a very good wind site and it's in the traditional territory of a particular First Nation and they are not able or not willing to come up with 25% equity contribution, well, then that what could be a very good wind site in terms of its power output and limited negative environmental impact might not be allowed to go ahead. It comes off the table. And so the concern is just that we might not have as many good projects being proposed or actually being de developed um, if the requirements are too prescriptive and not providing a flexible options for First Nations to participate. 
Um, there's that old saying, you know, gold is where you find it. Uh, good energy supply is often also where you find it. Uh, so uh, the wind blows where, where it does and the sun shines uh, best where it does. Uh, so you kind of have to work to uh, capture those benefits where you can. Um, we've uh, talked about upgrading the electricity grid already, I guess, to meet LNG requirements for that uh, big opportunity for our economies and First Nation job creation and, and participation in the economy in the, on the North Coast. But there are other uh, gaps as well. So I mentioned earlier that Fort Nelson, for example, is not connected to the main BC hydro grid that serves the rest of our province uh, due to distance and so on. Um, it's been getting by with a natural gas power plant uh, operated by BC Hydro, but there's been some recent challenges in the gas sector in that region, which may call into question the reliability of that BC Hydro plant to continue to operate. And then, of course, there's the clean BC policies of trying to phase out use of natural gas for electricity. Uh, that would leave Fort Nelson dependent on a relatively small but very long power line that stretches over northern BC, over the Alberta border and into northern Alberta for electricity. That line is really meant as backup, uh, but there's a risk that could become the main supply for Fort Nelson. Uh, again, increasing reliability concerns since that power line itself has had to be taken out of service several times in the last few, few years due to forest fire concerns. So uh, we think it's worth looking at options of connecting Fort Nelson to the main grid. And then inter ties with Alberta and Washington State, uh, given that we've been importing uh, larger amounts of electricity in recent years, it's important that we maintain the capacity and look to expand capacity uh, as our population grows and their population grows so we can take maximum advantage when uh, trading is required or and or beneficial. <clears throat> and then expanding natural gas transmission and hydrogen infrastructure. I, I mentioned already the BC Utilities Commission not to allow expansion of natural gas supply in the Okanagan. Uh, we think that's an error and that that kind of expansion is preferable to trucking uh, natural gas from the lower mainland over the coast mountains and into the Okanagan. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, also uh, the North, pardon me, the Pacific Northwest, we're not an island. We are interconnected and we've been importing electricity from our neighbors and we say thank you very much. Um, but we are also a major exporter of natural gas to our neighbors, uh, some of which they burn for, for electricity generation and then they're selling back to us. Uh, and so we benefit significantly by exporting natural gas to the Pacific Northwest, but that transmission capacity, those pipelines moving that natural gas down the center of British Columbia to the lower mainland and then south to Washington state and beyond um, has not been expanded for a significant period of time. And yet we know the economy is growing, population is growing in Washington state, Oregon, Idaho, and so forth. Um, and we think uh, an expansion of that capacity is again, must be part of future planning so that they're able to generate electricity for their own needs and sometimes to backstop us as required because it will take us a while to get more generation online here. Uh, and then hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, the BC government has made hydrogen a major focus already and we support looking at ways to expand hydrogen infrastructure, uh, but recognize that, you know, the again, hydrogen is probably not a silver bullet either. There isn't any one silver bullet to meet all of our energy needs, especially when you're trying to reduce GHG emissions. Uh, but uh, there is in innovative research taking place in various forms of making hydrogen, various processes for making hydrogen, pardon me. And we think that that uh, infrastructure is going to be required if it is going to be used as a transportation fuel for medium to larger size vehicles that aren't able to easily operate on electricity. And then this uh, item number eight, it's really kind of a, a higher level message, but it's very important, I think, for BC planning. Uh, we're so focused on what we're doing right here in terms of trying to reduce emissions within our geographic boundaries. But when you look at the global scale, the, the atmosphere doesn't really care where the emissions come from. They're, they're worried about the atmosphere is impacted by the overall amount of emissions around the globe. 
the emissions don't just stay within one geographic boundary. Uh, British Columbia uh, produces about uh, 13 one hundredths of 1% of global emissions. Uh, and that's not to say we shouldn't keep trying our best to, uh, within reason, to reduce our emissions and to innovate. But the reality is, even if we eliminated all emissions from British Columbia tomorrow, uh, that really wouldn't be noticeable uh, to the atmosphere. Because uh, when you're talking about 13 one hundredths of one percentage point, um, it's really a rounding error. So we need to think about how we can leverage energy from BC to have a bigger impact. And one opportunity is using LNG exports to help support countries elsewhere that are phasing out or would like to uh, find another alternative to coal um, for generating uh, energy electricity needs in their countries. And so that's already what's driving the investment uh, that's taking place in the North Coast and also for wood fiber, LNG, and or Squamish or export opportunities around the world, uh, specifically in the Asia Pacific area and uh, providing an alternative to coal. Uh, and that, that could have a significant impact globally on reducing GHGs. Um, asserting provincial jurisdiction over energy policy. Uh, some folks from municipalities might not agree with this, but uh, we've seen what happens when we have a um, kind of a patchwork approach. To energy policy becomes very difficult it can be more costly for people trying to build, whether it's commercial or residential properties, to having to adapt to different rules in different municipalities, and particularly when it comes to energy supply. Uh, that can be quite challenging. Uh, the province of Quebec has recognized this and recently, uh, I believe even this uh, earlier this year, passed legislation uh, requiring provincial uh, approval before cities or local governments can restrict the use of natural gas for new construction, uh, driven in part by concern from Quebec Hydro about how they're going to meet uh, future demands for electricity if natural gas is not an option for home heating. Uh, in, in many ways, they're facing a similar challenge to we to, to us here. So uh, we're calling for making it clear that the province has ultimate responsibility for energy policy, which really traditionally has been the case. And that's why the province has set up the Utilities Commission to review energy policies uh, implemented by uh, major utilities like Fortis and, and BC Hydro and um, and so forth. So that's one of our recommendations. And then revisiting the electric vehicle sales quotas, you know, uh, and replacing with emission standards. So trying to provide some more flexibility about how to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions without being as prescriptive about exactly how many vehicles must be electric versus other energy options for vehicles. Um, and and then taking another look at the timeline. Uh, you know, again, min many of the, the goals are laudable, but the pace and scale is questionable uh, as to whether it's feasible. So when you think about the 2026 model year in British Columbia, those vehicles from the 2026 model year will start showing up on dealers lots about this time next year. And they're going to be subject to a 20, 26% EV sales quota or mandate from the BC government. And vehicles that exceed that quota in terms of uh, non-electric vehicles will face a $20,000 per vehicle fine or surcharge. Um, I think that will come as a shock to many people that that's quite imminent. It's, you know, A year from now uh, is when that policy starts to bite. And when those 2026 20, model year vehicles start arriving, um, and it escalates to 90% by the 2030 model year. And again, those models would start appearing about this time in 2029. So it's really not that far off. And uh, it's just, it, again, the report from Professor Jesse Raleigh looked at the charging infrastructure that's woefully inadequate at this point to su support that. And the billions and billions and billions of dollars that are going to be required to help upgrade uh, transmission lines, uh, distribution lines, transformers, and put in charging stations to support that level of electric vehicle penetration. So again, we're calling for revisiting uh, the timelines as well as the sales quotas. We've got 19 minutes left for questions, and there are some good questions coming in. I would like to ask... This question, Barry, 
on the last of the 10 recommendations. Um, if we have the federal government of Canada now, as they have done, bringing in uh, quite uh, stiff tariffs on lower cost, uh, affordable, you might say, EVs from China, and uh, suddenly the prospect of those coming into the market uh, isn't isn't uh, there, we will more likely have higher priced EVs that most people won't be able to afford, and yet there's a penalty for uh, selling such a uh, selling an internal combustion engine vehicle to that person who wants a new car. Would it be far-fetched to think that should this policy persist and be the the way we do things and people don't have the the richest require the riches required to buy expensive EVs, our roads might look a little bit like Havana's in future. Uh, people driving used cars for a long, long time. Am I being uh, alarmist there, or do you think we're headed for something? It, it may uh, perversely actually increase interest in internal combustion cars. I think uh, what you're hinting at, there could be people wanting to hoard older vehicles uh, because they're more fam familiar and comfortable with that technology. I've been to Havana. I've uh, you know, marveled at the ingenuity of the Cuban people of keeping these 1950 Chevrolets operating, uh, not without a lot of effort and uh, string and tape and Bondo and other things, trying to keep those cars together. Um, that's not a, a happy prospect. Um, and no, I hope it doesn't come to that. Uh, but when you start to restrict the supply of internal combustion engine vehicles, which is what will start to happen here for the 2026 model year, arriving next year this time, uh, all things being equal, if demand is the same, but the supply is restricted, you would expect price to increase. And that's even without the $20,000 penalty being applied. Um, so yeah, it does beg the question about cost of living and this, the feasibility. We already know that a major impediment for people adopting electric vehicles is cost. And the province, the federal government has a, a rebate program of about $5,000 for qualifying vehicles. Uh, the BC government had a similar but more modest program, which they announced about five or six weeks ago, they're scaling back even more uh, based on the price of the vehicle. And so as a result of that, lowering the, the threshold of the price of vehicle that would qualify, it means about 75% of the vehicles that were available in the market today for that subsidy from the BC government are no longer available. So a number of things here, the federal government, uh, putting tariffs on vehicles from China. You know, many of the Teslas sold in British Columbia are actually made in China. So that tariff could bite on Tesla vehicles sold here. Uh, and then combine that with some reduced financial support from the province to incentivize uh, people purchasing EVs. These things taken together will actually make vehicles more difficult for uh, average British Columbians to buy. Right. A little bit of context here, Barry. Would you say that what you just described for EVs, but also the general policies that are subject to the 10 recommendations, is BC exceptional or is every other jurisdiction in North America, the 50 states and the 10 provinces doing pretty much the same thing or are we an outlier in any way? Well, BC is definitely a, a, a leader or outlier, depending on how you look at it, when it comes to the 90% requirement by 2030. Uh, we've taken a look around. We can't find any jurisdiction that has a 90% uh, target for electric vehicle sales by 2030, or for the 2030 model year. And California, their goal is 68% for 2030. Uh, British Columbia is 90%. Uh, and there is talk in California now of uh, revisiting that, that goal due to the, the resistance they're finding. The early adopters have purchased EVs, but the people that remain are a, a bit more concerned that maybe the EVs don't fit their lifestyle or their needs. So uh, it's it's going to be a stretch. Uh, and and our, by the way, our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, which are related here, it's partly what's driving the, those ambitious goals to eliminate natural gas for new construction by 2030 and also the EV mandate of 90% by 2030. That's tied to our GHG reduction targets in BC of 40%. Uh, re reduction compared to the 2007 year. With the carbon tax and other measures we've taken in British Columbia, we've managed to keep JHGs essentially flat since 2007, which is actually quite an accomplishment when you consider economic growth, population growth, and so on. 
but they've only remained flat. To think we're now suddenly going to have a 40% drop in about five years, five and a half years from now, um, is not credible uh, without serious dislocation to the economy um, and, and to everything it supports. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the target for next year is a 16% reduction in GHGs by next year. And as I've said, we've managed to be about 0% change since 2007 overall, but we're supposed to have a 16% drop by next year. Uh, I don't think that will happen. Mm -hmm. um, what's the impact being of the 10 recommendations, Barry? Obviously, we're in a political season. We're in the pre-writ period for the provincial election. The writ will be dropped, no doubt, to around the middle of September for the October 19th date. Uh, so parties are composing their platforms. Have you heard from any political parties? I've, I've heard uh, rumblings, yes. We've had some outreach from a couple of political parties. Uh, more than one, I, I won't say uh, who, but there are there is some uptake uh, in terms of interest in some of our recommendations and I'm wanting to understand more. Um, but it is the summer, so I think general public awareness is limited. People are rightly focused on enjoying the nice weather while it lasts uh, here in the province, and we have a beautiful province, so people are doing that. Uh, but I think uh, energy issues are always just around the corner because, again, they do affect everything we do. And so we're going to continue working to raise awareness um, as much as we can within the restraints during the election period uh, that we're subject to due to provincial law. There are restraints on activities, of course, uh, but um, we'll continue to speak when asked and uh, do media interviews uh, again when called upon. I was on CKNW this morning, Mike Smith, and uh, uh, we'll hopefully be on CBC Radio this afternoon as well at uh, 4.35 p.m. to talk about this. Right. Is that CBC Radio 1, Vancouver-based? I believe so. It's with uh, Gloria Makarenko. Okay. So we'll be able to hear Bruce later on today. Well, that's good that you're getting interest from outlets that, that have got a, a range in how they approach issues. It shows that you're resonating uh, broadly, which is really what we have always wanted to do. So um, do, do you uh, have a sense of UBCM? Uh, it's always interesting timing when a, it's an election year and you have UBCM uh, now that we have the mandated uh, fall, the elections, um, what do you think the mood will be? I noticed there was uh, some interest when it, the organizers announced how they were going to handle having the party leaders bring their um, speeches to the, the stage. What, what do you think delegates are going to be talking about in terms of the recommendation space that we're here to discuss? Well, I hope they will be talking about them. Um... Uh, we're still going through the policy handbook that's been put together, the way it works leading up to UBCM. And forgive me if you're a municipal councillor or mayor, you already know this, of course, but for others, uh, resolutions get worked up th through the system, through, through regional um, organizations uh, under the UBCM umbrella, and then, uh, pardon me, get compiled. And uh, so there's been a kind of a booklet that's been put together, I think it came out last week. Um, of the policy resolutions that are going to be going forward for debate and discussion at uh, UBCM when it's held in Vancouver in a few weeks' time. Um, uh, we'll be there uh, speaking to people who are interested in and talking about energy issues and answering any questions people might have. But of course, there's many issues that municipal councillors have to deal with. It covers the gamut. I, I know healthcare is a major concern, particularly in rural communities with Emergency rooms continuing to close and not be available to people. Um, Transportation is always a major focus. Uh, things with BC parks, you know, opportunities and access is always an issue. So there'll be many things on the agenda, uh, and we'll be there to answer questions uh, when topics around uh, energy come up. And you know, if anyone's interested in connecting with with Barry or uh, any of us directly, just drop us a line. You have the organizers' email that will. We're actually doing uh, through another uh, uh, effort of resource works on carbon solutions, a, a coalition of those who are really concerned with this issue. We're having a little reception and uh, I'm sure anyone who's on this call, who's looking to interact with us directly uh, could, could come along, drop us a line for that or, or set up a meeting through something really specific. Uh, we're open to that. I, I'm intrigued by a couple of questioners who've raised the phenomenon that's certainly true that grids in Canada operate north-south, grids in North America, right? Or BC's case, 
But what about East West? You know, could we somehow access the the nuclear power that's abundantly present in Manitoba, in uh, Ontario? Pardon me, in the the uh, Canadian made electricity in uh, Manitoba and Quebec from hydro. Is that possible? Uh, not currently. Uh, we have limited east west electricity connections in Canada. There are significant interconnections between Quebec and Ontario, uh, although probably not as great as they could be. Uh, there's some connection between Ontario and Manitoba, but not much. And, you know, it, it's just quite limited between Saskatchewan and BC. There isn't a direct connection. They, they have a limited intertie with Alberta, and then we have an intertie ourselves with Alberta. Um, th there just isn't a huge amount of east-west movement of electrons in our country. Um, and it is something that's sometimes pointed to as a stretch goal or as a, a major update, you know, a major project for the future to help further cement and tie our country together, much like the uh, the building of the railway did at the time of Confederation. Um, but that's, again, it's partly market forces. You know, where's the population center? Where's the demand? And where's the output coming from? But looking forward, you know, you could see a benefit of uh, drawing a, a greater interconnection supply or opportunities between provinces. Mm -hmm. um, Barry, you had the stick when you were in government on uh, carbon pricing. You brought in the first uh, uh, carbon tax of, 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 uh, of uh, North America of its type, and you watched a lot of things and you were an actor in that. Uh, you think back from those days, so 2000 aughts to today, 15, 20 years, uh, span of time, um, do, do you sense that there is a gap between aspiration-driven policy and the result of that? You know, if the at the end of the the aspire to period, uh, the ho thing hoped for has not been realized, but the result is that you have potentially a shortfall of the uh, sine qua non of of modern life of of energy supply that's reliable and affordable and environmentally high performing. Um, you know, what is, is there a sort of philosophical question here about how we approach these issues that we should be talking about too? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we were very optimistic. Uh, we introduced North America's first, as you mentioned, broad-based carbon tax. It was revenue neutral, meaning uh, by law, uh, any revenue generated through the carbon tax had to be refunded to British Columbians through offsetting personal and business income taxes and through other tax relief. And it was. Uh, that's no longer the case as of a few years ago in BC. Uh, it's no longer a net neutral uh, by law. But um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, we did not hit our targets. I'm sad to admit. Uh, we thought we could get up to one third reduction, a 33 percent reduction by 2020, uh, and that was over a 13 year time span. You know, from 2007 or 2008, we thought we could get down to 33 percent lower. Um, that didn't happen. Emissions did drop for a while, but then they came back up again with economic growth after the 2008 economic uh, global slowdown. Um, but uh, another way to look at it is our per capita GHGs continue to drop because our population is growing, but our overall emissions in BC stayed more or less the same. Uh, so in some ways that is a success, but it's not this kind of success we were hoping for. It does make me, I guess, a bit more cautious. So when I see you know, statements, we're going to reduce emissions now by 40% in five and a half years, when we really couldn't move them down at all in a meaningful way over 13 years, it makes me question the viability of that. It makes me quite skeptical. And I guess that leads to my bigger concern is I'm if I'm getting skeptical and a bit jaundiced about these GHG reduction targets, is the public starting to tune it out? Well, the public say, yeah, you know what? We've heard these promises and pledges before. It's going to be easy or it can be done and we can just reduce emissions. If only we had the willpower, we just emissions would go away. Um, I worry the public will start to lose interest in grappling with this challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and trying to uh, limit human-caused influences on climate change. I'm, I'm worried that over time, British Columbians and Canadians will start to tune it out because they've heard these goals and commitments and then they're not met. So that's that's a bigger concern. Do, do you think it would be a wise thing 
suppose you look at someone who's got a, a Ford 150, F-150, the most popular car in Canada for a number of years. I'm not sure if it is this year, but it has been, or Ram trucks. They might say, well, I'm just going to keep driving this thing for, you know, till it'll be my last car. I'll, I'll uh, die driving this thing, hopefully not while in it. Um, and the result will be that they have a higher emitting uh, set of wheels for, for the rest of their life. Uh, we're seeing places in the world where hybrids are becoming more popular. So you've got the efficiency of EV and you've got the reliability of gas or, or diesel when you need it. Um, would that be a sensible thing to be more open to rather than simply punishing everything that's not specifically an EV? Um, you're talking about what's, what's practical. And so, you know, Ford, for example, does have an all electric version of the F-150. It's called the Lightning, I think. Uh, but it comes with a very stiff price tag. And uh, I don't think they've sold in quite the numbers they'd hoped. They are selling, but maybe not as much as they'd hoped. Uh, I think it's just going to take more time. And technology does evolve, sometimes quicker than we expect. But those changes that seem to happen overnight are actually have been in the planning process for many, many years. A lot of research takes place behind the scenes that the general public is not aware of. And that takes time. And then all of a sudden, it's it, you know, it seems all of a sudden that it emerges as a commercial product, but really the research takes a lot of time. So the these the, the scale and the timelines that have been imposed by elected officials, at the encouragement of environmental activists, uh, you know, might make sense if you're just looking at GHG reduction targets. But you have to ask, is it actually realistic? Mm -hmm. And that's where there's a conflict, right, between um, the in political imperative and reality. Uh, thanks for all the great questions coming in. I'm going to kind of smush a couple together and come to what might be the last question because it's 1158. And I, I just want to ask and end on a note of perhaps optimism and also openness because we've spent a lot of time talking about um, some of these difficult transitions. Let's talk a little about uh, solar, uh, geothermal. I met last week with uh, Chief Charlene Gale from the Port Nelson First Nation, they have this really cool geothermal project. We've got interest in hydrogen, in biofuels from the forest sector, all kinds of things going on. What gives you some hope that there's a whole bunch of, of, of alternatives coming that are that are realistic? Uh, well, yeah, there are things that are happening. For example, re renewable natural gas or another place called biogas that is happening right now in British Columbia um, and it's scaling up. Um, and so that's an opportunity. You know, I, I come from the Fraser Valley uh, and it's providing another revenue source for our agricultural sector, our farmers to have a, a demand for a product that sometimes other people don't want, which is the uh, end product from dairy farms, for example, from dairy cows. Um, uh, there is uh, there are positive things happening. Uh, you know, solar power remains an underutilized form of energy. It's got maybe limited, more limited application in BC than elsewhere, but there is still room for growth there. Uh, I think BC now has two megawatts of solar power connected to our grid. Um, the government in BC Hydro recently announced some grants, uh, rebates for individuals for their homes. So there's uh, some renewed focus on that source of electricity. We'll see where that leads. It can be more expensive per kilowatt hour than other sources, but it is an option. Um, and, you know, there there is research being done on geothermal. BC does have some potential geothermal sites that have been talked about for a long time and have been researched, but more work needs to be done to get that across the finish line. I, I, I am reasonably optimistic that geothermal could produce some significant amount of electricity for BC, mm -hmm. but it's, it's going to have to happen with technological advances and some support. Right. Barry, I just heard that BC Hydro is ahead of its time. I mean, literally, because I just heard 15 seconds before uh, Apple said it was 12 o'clock, the four notes of the first four notes of, of O Canada from the BC Hydro horns sounded. So we're out of time. And I'd like to say thanks to everyone for attending. We've had an incredible uh, amount of retention. That means uh, there's something interesting here for all of you. So that means you're thinking about this. So uh, share those thoughts with us. You could email. There's other ways we've indicated, and we will look forward. This is not the last time we'll be gathering. Let's hope. And uh, uh, on that note, uh, Barry, did you want a final word? It's got to be a quick one. Yeah. If if we couldn't get to your questions, please send us an email, and we'll work to respond to each one. Okay. Thanks.
Goodbye. Thank you very much.